We'll try that one more time. I guess we have no sound today, but that's okay. Liam is unfortunately sick. And so could we have a round of applause for our new camera person today? This is Elisa Shioji. Um, <laughs> visiting all the way from Level 8 on Melbourne Connect, who will be uh, your master of ceremonies today. As we were yesterday, we were looking at structs for the first time, new ways of representing information in memory that were a little more flexible and behaved somewhat differently to arrays. This enabled us to group pieces of information together in ways that made logical sense. Our example was a student in the class, in this case, Birthday Josh, who yesterday told us who he was, where he was from, and how old he was. Combining these things into a single package using a struct allowed us to represent all of the information corresponding to him in a more concise way than would have been done if we'd had three separate arrays, one for names, one for age, and one for a place of origin. And remember, he was also with Laura, uh, so we had an, another variable for Laura. But you might ask, can we make arrays of structs? Because if we have Josh and Laura and Noah and Xinjiang and Emily and whoever else is in the class, we want to be able to store all of them and all of their packages of data together. So the natural thing is not just to have one struct, but to have an array of structs and then use them and process them together. We'll see how to do this in today's lecture, going through some code that allows us to represent multiple objects with all their associated pieces of data. There was, however, an error in yesterday's lecture, and I'm not sure if any of you caught it when it was delivered live, but the, the uploaded version does have a correction. But when I created a student yesterday using the code, I wrote this line out directly, Sam name equals Sam, and I used a string literal here. This is actually invalid C, and the fact that I made this mistake should show you how easy it is for you to make similar mistakes in general. If I had compiled it, which we didn't get around to doing, the compiler would have thrown us an error telling us that we're not allowed to do it, but we'll see what we should do instead in a matter of moments. Our question that we're going to kick off today with is, should we use structs as arguments to functions? Should we be passing them around, and why or why not? And I'd like to solicit a couple of opinions from you guys to figure out whether that's what we should be doing or not. So put your hands on your head if you think it's a good idea to pass structs around to, as arguments to function. Hands on heads. And hands in the air if you think it's a bad idea. Bad idea to pass structs around, hand in the air. Keep your hands up if it's a bad idea. Hands on heads if it's a good idea. OK, who's on the good idea team? We'll go up to you guys over there. Remind me your name again. My name is Hadizan. Hadizan? Yeah. And bad idea or good idea? I think it's a good idea. Good idea, why? Because you can access uh, more data type and it's more simple. Hadizan says it's a good idea because then you can uh, do more at a time and it's simpler to pass around structs rather than passing around lots of uh, individual variables that represent things. Now what about someone who's on the bad idea team? Who put your hands up in the air again if you thought it was a bad idea? OK, I see one hand, Angel, over there. We're coming over to you. It'll be a second. OK, Angel, why is it a bad idea, do you think, to pass structs around? Um, it's not necessarily like a bad idea. I just thought it would be better if we pass the pointer to the structs as an argument. Why do you say that? Uh, so Angel said that she thinks it would be a better idea if instead of passing around the structs, we pass around pointers to structs. Um, like it will be like you can like save a bit more space in a way and it will be um, easier to have like a like a pointer handle instead of like I don't know how to say it. So what do you mean by it saves us some space? Can you tell me a bit more? Because like a struct holds lots of stuff and um, but like by using a pointer you only need to pass the, uh, um, the address. And the what struct, happens so if we pass the whole struct? So you have to like you have to pass the whole thing? I mean, and then what does the function do? Well, remember what I said about passing by reference versus passing by value? What does C do? So you have to like copy the whole thing across. Yeah, so C, if we passed a struct, it would copy the entire struct with everything inside it into the new function. Thanks very much, Angel. And let's, uh, let's investigate this a little further by looking at a demo of, some, of one real life struct. Let's put that on mute again. Uh, also, at least if it starts making weird noises, move them away. 
This is a real life struct from the Linux kernel. This is the Linux operating system. And this struct is used by the, uh, the Linux operating system to keep track of all the programs that are currently running and to choose between which program gets to use up the computer's resources at a time. So I've started it scrolling, and you can see all that the struct has lots of things inside it. It's like int personality, int exit status, int uh, unsigned user fault. And there are a whole lot of different things that this struct stores. I mean, I have too many for me to even count or for you to even count right now. We're going through hundreds and hundreds of lines of code that make up all the different properties of a process inside the Linux kernel. Now, if Angel is right, and when we pass this entire block of information to a new function, we copy everything inside, it looks like we're gonna be copying an enormous amount of information. There are a very, very large number of items within this struct, so much it's, it's still going, so much so that if we replicate this every time, not only will it take extra time for the computer to copy this entire object from one part of the Linux kernel to the other from different functions inside the Linux kernel, it'll also start using up huge amounts of memory and we might even get a stack overflow. There we go, it is finally finished, it took like a minute and a half for me to just scroll through the different fields in this struct. And so while passing around small structs is perfectly fine, say your struct has two elements, that's probably not going to induce very much overhead. But if we're using structs like this, Angel is ultimately right in that it makes more sense to pass the pointer around. Because remember, when we pass a pointer around, instead of copying the entire object over, we just copy over the address of the thing we're talking about. So if the task struct lives at location 1c, and we pass the address 1c around, every function is going to receive a copy of the value 1c, and is instead of receiving a copy of this entire thing. Then when it wants to use this struct, it can just look at address 1c to find the entire contents of the object that we were talking about. So structs are too big to willy-nilly pass around, and so it's good practice to get in the habit of using pointers to structs. Let's see how this operates on a bit of real life code. So here we have a struct for planets. And I'm going to create one planet here, the Earth. And we'll talk about struct initialization syntax in a moment. We'll come back to this. Then I have some timing functions and I'm going to run copy struct and pointer struct. I'm going to use this struct in two different ways. In this instance, I'm going, to copy, I'm going to copy the entire struct into the function, and in the other one, I'm going to reference the struct using its pointer. Notice here I'm using the ampersand symbol, and remember from earlier that the ampersand symbol gets us the address of something, and that's how one way of getting a pointer to an object. This is still pretty loud. Let's try that. Okay. And then I just have some timing functions to see how long it takes to do uh, 10 to the power of eight copies or accesses to the function. Now, if we look at pointer struct and copy struct, they do absolutely nothing other than going back to the function where we started. So the only thing that this program is timing really is how long it takes to set up the function if we're using the, uh, if we're copying, and how long it takes to set up the function if we're just copying the address instead. Let's give this one a run and see what happens. I've compiled it, let's run it. There we go, it took 4.8 seconds to pass the struct directly, resulting in a copy of 403 billion bytes. Whereas if I was passing the pointer to do the same amount, to call a function the same amount of times, only took 0.2 seconds and we only had to copy 800 million bytes. We still have to copy bytes in this case because a pointer is still memory. But uh, on my operating system, a pointer is just eight bytes as opposed to the struct, which is far more. And we won't go into how to figure out on your own exactly how big a struct is. That's a more advanced topic. But you can see that in any case, a struct that's fairly simple with just um, three doubles and a short string, which is the name of the, uh, the, name of the planet, 
or it's not so short, 2,000 characters. That's probably a little large for a name. We'll change that in a minute and see what happens. But you can see even with a relatively small struct, it still takes miles and miles more time, orders of magnitude. It took three orders of magnitude more. Now let's see what happens if we make our struct a little more reasonable and do this with just a maximum planet name of 20 characters. Or even better, we'll do it with 10 characters. Our planet names aren't that long. Let's compile it again, update our program. Now we can see that there's far less of a problem now that they're more comparable in size. It now took 0.26 seconds for the one that did all the copying, and it only took 0.18 seconds for the one that passed the pointer. This is because the, the amount of memory that we're now copying, the size of the object that we have to copy is much smaller. But it's still a meaningful difference, and if your program runs, does far more operations than just what I'm doing here, you'll get much more meaningful and significant overhead. This is still very loud. Um, the differences in the number of copies is still very significant, but we have shrunk by two orders of magnitude, which is certainly a good thing. This is the declaration for a pointer of a struct. It's very simple. It's very similar to our declaration of a, um, of a normal struct where we just didn't have the pointer symbol, the asterisk. But by adding the star in, what we've done is just created a pointer. Now, one thing to be very careful about is this does not actually give us any space in which to store the object. This is just an 8-byte object that can store a, an address at best. So you can't yet fill this up with the contents of a student. We'll see how to do that in a minute. But before then, we're going to go to Noah, who has a question. Um, I was just wondering if uh, when you declare a struct, if the addresses that are used to store the various variables are sequential, like they are when you declare an array. That's a very good question. The question was, if I declare a struct, um, let's say we're not using this pointer syntax for the time being, if you declare a struct normally, does the variable end up in the same place as the other variables, and as a result, is it in the same order? The answer for approximately the next 60 seconds is yes. When you use a struct, when you declare a struct without a pointer, it does get put on the normal way, but we're about to see a second way of creating structs, which actually puts them in a different place in memory where you don't get that sequential guarantee. Hmm. Does that make iteration harder? Not necessarily, because you can still structure your memory such that you have a way of figuring out where things are. But we'll talk about that in the next... Uh, two hours worth of lecture. We also have some syntactic sugar inside C that allows us to use these pointers to structs much more simply than we might otherwise. This is the syntax at the bottom is the syntax that you'd or, uh, ordinarily use if you were thinking, okay, I've got a pointer and the pointer is a struct and I want to access something inside the struct. So I will dereference the pointer and then I'll use a dot to access the thing inside it because that's the syntax we use in C. It's the dot to access the elements of the struct. But because everyone knows about this issue with passing around entire structs, C comes built in with some syntactic sugar, again, an easier way of writing and talking about pointers to structs. So if you, uh, the font that I'm using is combined the two characters, but it's a minus sign followed by an angle bracket. If you do a minus sign angle bracket name, that is equivalent to that second line over there that dereferences the pointer and then gets the element. Just make sure when you're doing your coding for assignments, etc., to distinguish whether you're the object that you're trying to access is a struct or is a pointer to a struct. Because if you use the wrong syntax, your code will maybe segfold, won't work, might not compile. You'll have to figure it out and maybe post on Grok for help if you get stuck. So method, we've got two methods of creating a struct pointer. Method one is as above. So firstly, we create the student. Um, and then we, uh, as normal as we did in our code example for the planets, and then on the next line, we create a pointer and we set the pointer to, ooh, there is an error on this slide. Can someone see what the error is? Yeah, I'm missing an ampersand next to my student Kwaku over there. So if I try to assign that directly, I would get a type error because I'm trying to assign something that is a student object, a student struct on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, I have a pointer to a student. And so those two things are different. What I actually want is the address of the student over here. So if I'm going to, I probably have time to correct this quickly and show you what I'm talking about. 
There we go. If I want to use the a pointer to the struct that I'm talking about, I need this ampersand here. So that's my method one. Create a struct, create a pointer to the struct, assign the address of the struct to the pointer, done. And then I can use uh, my print student name function up there that I've written in one line. Method two for creating a struct pointer. And this is where things start to get exciting. We're about to learn a new bit of C. I've been holding out all semester for this. Takes a few more lines of code, but this is going to open up a whole new range of powerful things for us to do. So let's step through it a little slowly at first, and then we'll build up and build up until you're writing giant programs that use up all of the computer's memory with a few lines of C. Okay, so the first thing we do is we uh, declare our pointer to a student. And remember I said before that when you have a pointer, that's just eight bytes. If we want to actually create a whole student, we need more than eight bytes. We need room for the entire object. So we have this special C function here called malloc. And malloc is going to instruct the operating system to allocate memory to us. It's going to give us a chunk of memory that we're then free to use as we wish. Rather than us having to create a variable and the compiler automatically deciding how much memory to give that variable, we can actually ask the operating system directly for some memory. And if you keep asking and asking and asking for memory, pretty soon you can use up the whole thing. Your operating system might have a few protections about that, but it's certainly a fun way to see your system crash is allocate more and more and more in memory. So that's what we're doing over here. We're asking the computer to give us some memory and to give us a pointer to that memory. And once we have that chunk of memory, we can then treat it as a, uh, just as we would any other variable. So we have a pointer to the memory, and now we can um, fill up that memory with our various different things. So we have our syntactic sugar that allows us to avoid having to write out this funny syntax and dereference the pointer. And then here in this slide, you can see we're using that syntax to access different elements of the, of the structure. Once we have dealt with this memory, we can use it to pass into a function that takes a, a pointer to a structure. And then at the end, we have to free the memory. So we've asked the computer to give us a chunk of memory. And now we also have to let the computer know that it's time to give it back. Unlike with our normal variables, which, which get destroyed when the stack frame is destroyed, malloc is not giving us memory on the stack. It's giving us memory in a different place in the computer. And we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. But for the time being, we the thing we have to know is that because it's not stored on the stack, it's not going to get cleaned up when all the stuff on the stack is destroyed. It's being stored in a different part of the computer's memory. So when we're done with using it, we tell the computer, OK, it's time to free up that chunk of memory. You can reuse it for whatever purposes you like. And that is the free statement over there. And we pass in the pointer to that chunk of memory. And the computer recognizes it's a chunk of memory that it's given out and knows how much memory to take back. And we'll see that again tomorrow. This is the man page for malloc. And it's uh, a little intimidating again because we've got all these different functions that all do roughly the similar things. We've got malloc, calloc, realloc, realloc-f, valloc, et cetera. In this class, you aren't going to be tested on how many of these functions you know. But that's not really the point here. The idea is that each of these functions allow you to allocate memory in different flexible ways. So by reading through the man pages, and let's see what would happen if I actually tried this out on a live running computer. Let's do man malloc. And then you can scroll through and see all the different functions available. But let's look at a little bit of the description at least. The malloc, etc., functions allocate memory. We can ignore the next little bit. The malloc function allocates size bytes of memory and returns a pointer to the allocated memory when done. So let's look at the signature for malloc. And malloc takes one argument that is the amount of memory that we want to allocate. So that seems relatively clear. And let's look up free as well, because that's the other one we need to know right away. The free function deallocates the memory allocation pointed to by pointer. If pointer is null, no operation is performed. There's never a day without a technical glitch, is there? In this case, the technical glitch is Liam. OK, so malloc returns a pointer to the memory we allocated. But we have to give it back once we're done with free. If you don't give it back, we're going to run into the little problem that I was describing before when you allocate more and more and more and more memory without giving it back to the operating system. 
If your program does this and keeps allocating memory and you forget as a programmer to free some of the memory, this is called a memory leak. And it's actually pretty common in a very popular type of web, a very popular type of application, which is your web browser. Web browsers are notorious for having memory leaks. So if you look into one of the things that shows you how much memory is being consumed in your computer's RAM at any one time, and you see that your web browser is using a lot and a lot of memory and it just keeps getting bigger, and it's probably a memory leak. Uh, Chrome was particularly notorious for this for a good number of years. So let's look at our malloc syntax again. We'll see that malloc, we've given it an argument, size of student t. So we have another useful function, keyword, a, a, a something called size of that probably does what you expect. It gets the size of the object in the parentheses. There are some limitations to this though. So size of is actually an operator. It's not a function. It's just like a plus symbol or a minus symbol in C. This means that it doesn't create a new stack frame when you use it. It doesn't, it doesn't take arguments in the regular way. It's an operator. Just like the plus sign has things on either side of it and it does an operation, so too is size of. However, we do typically um, use parentheses when using the size of operator just to make things clear. So it is a bit of a bonus. The result of size of is an unsigned int. So like if you do an addition of two floats, uh, the addition operator, when you add two floats, produces a float. Size of always produces an unsigned integer. But the type that you get back from size of isn't unsigned int. It's something called size underscore t that the operating system is allowed to choose quite how big that integer is based on how much memory the operating system can support. So on all the 32-bit systems, the size, a size T type would be able to have a maximum size that's lower than it would on a 64-bit system, which can have more memory. Because remember, 32-bit numbers only go up so high, and if you can only count so high, you can only have as much memory as high as you can count. So on a 32-bit system, we were limited to 4 gigabytes of RAM, and on a 64-bit 64, uh, 64, uh, system, uh, we can have a lot more than that, something in the terabytes. I think someone can correct me on that. But size of, it's a trap. As we've finally come back to Admiral Akbar, it's been a little while since we've seen him. Size of does not always work on arrays. If you've already passed the array out to a different function and then you try and call size of on the array inside the function, it won't work. Does anyone have a guess why this might be? What do we know about arrays and memory? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go back, all the way to the back again. You guys have, have got, had it easy for too long. Okay, okay. remind, remind me your name. name. Uh, my name is Warren. Uh, Warren, we have spoken before, I think. No? Okay. Um, it's not gonna work because um, if you pass an array... Hold um, the other one as If well. you pass an array, um, a pointer of the array is passed, not the array itself. Yeah, so Warren makes a really good point. When we pass arrays around, instead of copying the entire array, remember we pass the pointer to the array. And this is going to confuse the compiler if you try and use the size of operator because it's going to be expecting to get the size of, of a pointer and not an array, which was the thing you were originally made before you passed along. So this is why it's good to uh, be aware when you are passing arrays around to pass around the length of the array as well and not to rely on the size of operator. You can use the size of operator with arrays if you're careful and only use it when they were originally declared, but you should be careful to make sure that you don't do this habitually or you'll fall into this trap. Yes, Hanny. Hi. Can we just dereference the pointer in the function? If you dereference a pointer that is referencing an array, what do you get? Do you get an array? Oh, the first element. Yeah, you get the first element. So you'd get, if you do size of on a dereferenced pointer to an array, you'd get the size of the first element. Make sense? Yeah. So here you see the task struct from the Linux kernel that we were talking about before that represents a program on our computer. Within the task struct, we also have a thread info struct. 
So on a modern operating system, every program can have multiple threads. So for example, your web browser might have multiple tabs, and you don't want the tabs to interfere with each other, you want them to have separate memory, you want them to be able to run at different times because some of them might be very, uh, like it might be Netflix using up a lot of processing power, and when Netflix is in the background, you want to make it low priority. Or maybe uh, you have other information about the process and about about the thread that you want to pass around. So we will store that information within a substruct within the task. We could even have an array of thread info structs within our task struct to enable us to keep track of multiple, multiple of them at once. My suspicion here is that thread info in the task, actually, I'm not going to make that assumption. There is definitely a way in the Linux kernel where they do represent multiple threads in the process. I'm not 100% sure how it's done, but if you want, I can put the link and you can browse through the Linux kernel source code. It's actually fun to do once in a while. We have our task struct, and within that, we have our thread info struct, and this is somewhere else within the same C file. We have a definition of this thread info struct, which itself contains a reference back to the task struct from which it came. So the task struct has a thread info, and the thread info has a pointer back to the task struct. This is more a matter of convenience just to allow you to navigate if you say you've passed the thread info around and you want to be able to use it to access back at the, you want to use it to access the task struct, you can do that by having a pointer to the task struct back inside the thread info struct. Now we have some demos, and these will take up a good chunk of today and tomorrow. Today we're going to focus a little bit on uh, the remainder of structs. Tomorrow we'll cover a little bit more of malloc, and then we'll see our first dynamic data structure. So a data structure that you change as time goes along, unlike the prior data structures that we've seen that we like construct once and kind of leave them there. So now we're going to uh, the computer to look at our different struct demos, starting with struct.c. We've already seen slow struct.c, so we'll look at that first. We have our planet struct that we're going to create, and here we have a type def that we're using so that instead of having to write struct planet t Jupiter, we can just write planet t Jupiter. Remember, type def is just a way of us finding another way of referring to a type that already exists. So in this case, the planet t type already exists, but we'd have to use uh, yeah, if we did that and made a planet old t and we wanted to refer to it quickly without having to use the word struct every time, we could do and give ourselves a new type that's just planet t. So the only reason we're using type def here is to enable us to not have to write the word struct over and over and over and over. Give it a try, it'll make more sense once you actually do it yourself. Let me reverse all these changes, because no doubt I've made an error somewhere. There we go, struct.c. Um, this was from yesterday, so let's get rid of that and look at the rest of this. Okay, we have a number of different ways of creating structs, of both of allocating the memory for them and initializing them, that is filling them with their contents. So in this case, we are just creating a normal one. There's no point to stuff going on here yet. And this is one way of performing the initialization step where we actually fill it. Rather than using our syntax to set the individual elements, what we can do is, assuming that we're willing to add in all the elements ahead of time, we use an open curly brace and a closed curly brace, and then fill in each of the elements that make up the struct. So in order, name, orbits, distance, mass, radius. So name, orbits, distance, mass, radius. You'll notice here we actually are allowed to use a string and set it directly instead of using str copy. This is an exception that you're allowed to use if you're creating structs using this initialization syntax. This is again just a C quirk. Here I've created a third planet, but this time I've only allocated the memory for it 
I haven't initialized it. That is, I haven't filled it with the information that will make it meaningful. Then in my main function, I create another planet. I use a function to copy, uh, copy the struct. I then print the planet. I print a version with the pointer and print a version uh, normally. OK, let's look at print planet. Print planet uses the dot syntax. As an argument, it takes the a struct. It doesn't take a pointer to a struct, so this is the slow copy one. And inside, we then access each of the elements using the normal dot syntax. Our print statements operate just as they would on any other variable type. So uh, for a struct of planet t, the dot name is a p string dot t. And a p string dot t is a character array of length 20. So it's just an amalgamation of all the different things we've learned about syntax before. Hash defines, which allow us to substitute in values. So that's equivalent to writing 20 there. A type def. So this enables us not to have to write this over and over. Instead, it allows us to just use p str underscore t, and then the struct syntax for accessing struct elements. And so all those things are combined together to produce this outcome over here. Copy struct enables us to read from the terminal using scanf and create a new planet. So it prompts the user for please enter, enter name, orbits, distance, mass, radius. And if you look at our scan f, we read in a string, then another string, then a floating point number, then a floating point number, and then a floating point number. And we assign them to name, orbits, distance, mass, and radius. Uh, these are string arrays. Let me start that again. Name and orbits are string arrays. Because they are string arrays, they are inherently, or character arrays, they're inherently already pointers. And so we don't need an ampersand out the front because scanf would normally require us to give it a pointer for a string. And these two things already are pointers. These things are already pointers. Scanf expects pointers. As a result, we don't need ampersands. However, distance, mass, and radius are not pointers. They're just the normal type of variable. As a result, because scanf expects pointers, we need to give it pointers. And if you recall, scanf requires pointers for the uh, values that we're going to fill because it wants to know the addresses where it's going to store what the user has typed in. And if, we, if it's going to change what's inside those addresses, we need to give it those addresses, which is why we're using the ampersands here. Then we have the same thing, just done for the pointer version of the struct. Now you'll see again, that we can still use our, um, our minus sign followed by the angle brace syntax. And this still gives us a uh, pointer. So I think the slide originally was correct. And then in the, for these ones, we need to explicitly add the ampersand because uh, it's still expecting pointers. And when we do that, it's not giving us a pointer. That's dereferencing it, which gives us the actual value of the struct and the actual types in the, inside the struct with doubles. Here we just have a normal loop. We're checking to make sure that we have indeed read in the five items. If we haven't read in the five items, return end of file or an error. Now ready to give this one a run. Clang. Enter name. So we will call this planet And is it expecting orbits? Orbit, Albert orbits FOA at a distance of, let's say, one, two, three, four, five rows, uh, a mass of 65, and a radius. What would you say your radius is? 600 meters. It's a little large. Okay. 
Albert operates FOA, orbital distance is five million kilometers. It's pretty, are you sure you can hear me back there? Um, his mass is 2.28 times 10 to the negative 314 kilos. <laughs> Have you been eating enough? And the radius is also pretty small. I'm not sure, oh, we, that didn't quite work. Um, we, might, we might have typed in something incorrect, but... Oh, there's not meant to be commas, I think, is what's going on. Yeah, it's not expecting commas. We can try that again, and it might work. Just crashed. We will figure out what's going on there another time. But you get the idea. Okay, and now we have one more demo, and we do have enough time for it. This is taking us back a little bit, going back to our string sort, and this one doesn't use structures. However, it does use malloc. And remember that we were talking about all these fancy algorithms for building suffix arrays and for um, doing our pattern search. Well, here I've actually gone and implemented one of them to give you a look at the sheer horror of what a slightly trickier algorithm looks like. This took me, I think, six or seven hours to get right after trying to hunt down bugs. Admittedly, I used artificial intelligence to try and write it the first time, and that was a mistake, because it turns out that AIs make bugs too, um, and probably would have been better off writing it myself. But let's see what's going on here. So I have anything you don't understand in this program, don't worry too much. The program itself is not assessed. I just wanted to give you a look at it. So I have a function that is going to call my ternary sort that I've written up here. And this is just a convenience function to help me start off ternary sort. And then the main ternary sort function I have is in here. Ternary sort, if you remember, was, was very, very similar to quick sort, except we would choose a pivot as the first letter of a string. And then we would sort into three piles, words or strings that started with a letter that was before the letter we just chose, strings that started with a letter that was the same as the one we just chose, and strings that started with a letter after. Once we'd made those three piles, we'd go through each pile and do the same thing, except the middle pile where we'd start looking at the second letter instead of the first letter, because we'd already sorted by the first letter. So very similar structure to quick sort, and so in here, the structure looks similar. Choose a random pivot that I'm doing there my partition function, which sorts out those three piles, and then three recursive calls. One recursive call, another recursive call, and another recursive call. And you'll note that my middle recursive call has depth plus one in here that allows us to search from the next character on in the string that we haven't yet looked at because we've already sorted the first letter, so sort the second letter. If, you've already, if you're looking at the middle pile and you've already sorted the second by the second letter, sort by the third letter, and so on and so forth. Go back to the lecture on ternary quicksort if you want a refresher on how exactly that works. Then I have, oh, I hear students outside. Well, we'll clear up in a minute. Then I have also implemented regular quicksort. Remember, this required us not to compare on the first letter, but to compare the entire string, and we only make two piles. Every string who that is comes in order before the string we're comparing to and every one that compares after. The key difference between the two is whether we compare the entire string at once or whether we just sort based on the first letter or the letter that we're up to. So that's our partition function there. And blessedly, quicksort itself is really, really simple and easy. I would encourage all of you to try writing a quicksort by hand. Then I have a function that runs tests to see which is faster. Is our fancy ternary quicksort faster, or is the basic quicksort faster? One other thing that I've added here is I'm also using qsort, which we'll come back to, I think, in maybe week 11 or week 12, which is a built-in version of quicksort that C comes in with. One thing to note, though, is despite the fact that it looks like it's definitely quicksort, different operating systems might actually choose to make qsort something different from quicksort. And so I've thrown it in there just to see is the built-in operating system one that people have spent a really long time optimizing and make sure it works well. Is that really, is that better than ternary quicksort where we've chosen an overall really sophisticated algorithm? Let's see. So this is string sort, and I'm going to feed in Moby Alpha which is, let's open Moby Alpha so you have a very quick look at it. This is the full text of Moby Dick. 
This is a really long thing to build a suffix array for. Arr. Call me Ishmael. Okay, let's see what happens. Segmentation fault. Well, oh, I know why this is. Um, the operating system limits the amount of memory that you're allowed to allocate on the stack, and so I'm just going to override that. And I'm going to say, give me 65 megabytes of memory instead of the built-in 8 megabytes. Now let's run it again. There we go. So for my normal version of Quicksort, it took 36 million character comparisons, so every time it checks to see is this character bigger than that one, is that character bigger than that one, and compares that for every string over and over. Did 36 million of those, and it took 0.29 seconds to do, to create the suffix array for Moby Dick. It's gone? Battery's gone. Battery's gone. Okay, just in time anyway. Um, the uh, built-in Q sort was 33, did 33 million comparisons and took 0.27 seconds, so a little faster. And then my special hand-coded ternary quicksort only did one million comparisons and beat them both out pretty handily. So there you can see the advantage of writing a more sophisticated algorithm. But in order to get this to work, I had to use malloc in a bunch of places. So this is what enables some of our more sophisticated algorithms, is being able to dynamically handle memory. With that, we are done for the day. Thank you very much. As always, such a pleasure to see you. Please get your assignments done on time. If you haven't started, today would be a really, really good day to start. But I will catch you all tomorrow. See you soon. Thank you.